What is primary hyperhidrosis? First, let's make a disclaimer. This is not intended for medical use. This is meant only to provide an overview of the disease and should not be interpreted as medical counseling or advice. If you believe you have hyperhidrosis, please seek your physician. If you believe a patient of yours has hyperhidrosis, please check the latest guidelines. Now, with that out of the way, hyperhidrosis is a pathological condition, a disease defined by excessive sweating beyond thermoregulatory physiological needs. That is, you are sweating even though you are already cool enough, which is the primary purpose of sweating, to help cool the body to an adequate temperature. If your body surface is already at an adequate temperature, you shouldn't be trying to decrease it further. Essentially, it's a disease characterized by sweating when it wouldn't be necessary or even undesirable from a physiological viewpoint. Primary hyperhidrosis usually presents no mortality or risk for loss of organ or sense. However, it can cause considerable impairment of daily activities and psychological distress in patients. Hyperhidrosis can be primary or secondary. If it's secondary, it can be secondary to pregnancy, menopause, diabetes, obesity, fever, autonomic degenerative disorders, cerebral infarction, spinal cord injury, Harlequin syndrome, metabolic disorders, hyperthyroidism, phylchromocytoma, chronic infections, lymphomas, eprin hematomas, carcinoid syndrome, tuberculosis, AIDS, endocarditis, drugs such as antidepressants, oral hypoglycemics, tryptans, antipyretics, cholinergics, and sympathetic mimetics. So, yeah, let's go through primary hyperhidrosis. Primary means it's not secondary to anything. So, the pathogenesis of primary hyperhidrosis is most often attributed to sympathetic hyperactivation. Primary hyperhidrosis is usually focal, involving palmar, plantar, and axillary regions most often, in isolation or in association with each other. This is mostly because these are the areas of highest density of eccrine glands, which is where the hypotonic secretion, known as sweat, is produced in the greatest quantity. The craniofacial region is sometimes involved, and there are also other presentations, such as inguinal hyperhidrosis, known as Hexhill's hyperhidrosis, however, these are rarer. Primary means it's not secondary to anything, so the pathogenesis of primary hyperhidrosis is most often attributed to sympathetic hyperactivation. That is, the sweat glands themselves are perfectly normal from a histopathologic point of view. Instead, the problem is with hyperstimulation from the innervation. The sympathetic nerves are sending excessive stimuli to the sweat glands, causing them to produce sweat when in fact they shouldn't be producing it. It's a problem of hyperactivation, of too much nervous stimuli. Each pseudomotor dermatome receives ipsilateral innervation from several adjacent segment levels, for example, T1 to T4 for the head and T2 to T5 for the hand or T3 to T6 for the armpits. Some hallmarks of the disease that help differentiate its clinical presentation from normal sweating include, for example, a family history, that is, a history of other relatives that also exhibit excessive sweating, increased sweating or worsening of the condition under psychological stress, such as nervousness, the fact that the sweat is highly localized, for example, the patient sweats mostly 
on the palmar regions, but not on the whole body, usually, for example. And, finally, sweating even in the cold. If the patient complains of sweating, even when he or her is feeling cold, it is a fact that points towards hyperhidrosis. Treatment for hyperhidrosis can usually be divided as clinical, non-surgical procedures, or surgical procedures. Clinical or pharmacological treatment includes topical creams and lotions, which are antiperspirants and try to decrease sweating, which are easy to apply but usually short-acting, per oral medications such as anticholinergics, which block part of the nervous stimuli to the sweat glands and are effective but often have side effects, non-surgical procedures such as iontophoresis, which is based on electrical currents, and is non-invasive, but can be hard to find, botulin toxin A, or commercially Botox, application, which is usually regarded as highly effective, but can be expensive, and requires many needles to the skin, which some patients may find displeasing, and microwave thermolysis, which is a form of ablation or destruction of the sweat glands, a method not so readily available in many regions, and surgical procedures, which consist essentially of thoracoscopic sympathectomy. A video-assisted surgery, which aims to stop the sympathetic nerve stimuli right at the sympathetic ganglia, in the posterior thorax, slightly adjacent to the spinal cord. Sympathectomy is also regarded as highly effective and mostly permanent. However, it's a surgical procedure and requires inpatient care and also exposes the patient to the small, albeit not non-existent, risk of adverse events. So, whom should I search for hyperhidrosis treatment? Or, whom should I send my patients to if I suspect they have hyperhidrosis? Well, primarily, you have to discard secondary hyperhidrosis causes, such as, for example, metabolic syndromes. Once you are pretty sure that it's indeed a primary hyperhidrosis case, the two most skilled professionals are usually a dermatologist or a thoracic surgeon. Make sure you discuss with your patient if he has a particular interest in surgery or if he would like to try non-invasive methods first. Thank you for your attention in this video. It was largely based in a paper I co-authored and published last year. If you wish to learn more about this topic, be sure to check it out. It will be in the description and in the upper right corner. Thank you again for your attention, and if you've liked this video, please consider leaving a like. See you on the next topic!